one month seven is our longest. Number one month seven, pray about every. school you just went through Genesis and so uh, I remember uh, them talking about sort of what I was talking about uh, what I want to uh, speak about this evening but in Genesis 41 I'm going to start reading verse 38 <clears throat> I'm going to read about the sons of Joseph yeah when you read the, uh, read the uh, life of Joseph it's, it's, to me it's always inspiring as people have said, you know, when you read uh, the life of Joseph, you, know, you see so many comparisons and types of Jesus Christ in this book. <coughs> you know, things that he overcame and what he had to do, even the name. You know. And so, uh, what a blessing. But let's start reading in verse 38 of Genesis chapter 41. Follows as I read here, it says, And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is? a man in whom the Spirit of God is. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all these, all this, 
There is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy words shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand, and arrayed him in a vesture of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck. <clears throat> And he made him to ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried before him, and bowed the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee there shall no man lift up his hand or foot in the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name uh, Zaphnath uh, uh, Penea. And he gave him, to him, uh, gave him to wife, Ashenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. Of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt, and Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt, and in the seven plenteous years of the earth brought forth by handfuls. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up uh, the food in the cities and food of the fields, which was round about every city, laid he up in the same. And Joseph gathered corn as the sands of the sea very much until he left numbering, for it was without number. And unto Joseph were born two sons. Therefore the years of famine came, and uh, as, as, Asenath, uh, uh, the daughter of uh, Potiphar, priest of On, bare to him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manassas. For God, uh, for God, said he, had made me to forget all my toils and all my father's house. And the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God had caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. You know, here, you know, as you're reading, you see these two sons, and as you go through, you see how there at the last, he does prosper. But that wasn't much of the life of Joseph. He's 30 years old, but he starts out as a young man uh, in his father's house and going through trials and like you would not believe. Nothing ever asked for, but as he said to his brothers, he said, God meant for good. My life uh, is directed of God, but it wasn't the life that you choose. It wasn't the way that you, being a child of a family, would choose to go. You wouldn't. You wouldn't say, "Boy, I like to be in this family, but you know, let me be sold into slavery. Let me uh, live the life of a slave." And uh, but God had, had a way of directing and leading. And so, as you and I, you know, get into our Christian life, we never know what we're what, what we're going to do. We never know what uh, I guess the end of our life is going to be. I know uh, when I started out as as a Christian, I never thought I'd end up in Australia. I never thought I'd be here. Now, it just wasn't anything I could envision. But God had other ideas. And so God uh, led me on a path as he's leading you on a path of your life. But before going far, let's do pray. <clears throat> Our Father, we ask that, Lord, you be with us and help us, Lord, as we have this time together. Lord, I pray that you would speak and help us to understand the life of Joseph in a way that, Lord, as we uh, face the, the trials of life, as we face things that just aren't quite right. Lord, I pray that we had learned from these two sons that Joseph had. Lord, I ask that you direct me and help me to, uh, to speak again with thy control. Be with thy spirit. Take the service we've given unto thee. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. You know, when I first started reading the Bible, I never thought much about it. I thought, uh, God uh, you know, put the Bible out there just because I was never taught to read well. And so uh, I, I, I came to these, these names and, whew, man, why did God uh, have Hebrews named like that? I mean, why couldn't they just have John or Ralph or something like that? I just, that would have been easy. Yeah. Why couldn't all the girls be named Sue or something? But no, they give them all these, these names, and that's hard enough. 
But as I, as I grew in the Lord, I started hearing preachers preach, and they started bringing out names, what names meant. You know, and I, I was taken back because, you know, I saw how important the name was. Yeah. Yeah. He might have a good name, but, you know, think about my first name. I've got Larry. Yeah. Oh, the only other person I ever knew who was a Larry was one of the three stooges. <laughs> yeah, Mo, Larry, and Curly. And if you look at this, I've just got, got, got his haircut almost. Yeah. And so I thought, boy, what's, what's a Larry? Yeah. And so I started looking up to see what a Larry was. You know what, you know what Larry is? A Larry comes from Lawrence. And you know what Lawrence is? Lawrence is, uh, a Lawrence means the leafy crown. And so I thought, well, that's, that's something strong to give a, uh, give a boy. I mean, I'm just some kind of a leafy thing to put on top of your head. Yeah, I know that they, they talk about the victor's crown and all that, but yeah, I, ne I never thought about a leafy crown. So I never thought my name was, was a great choice. And so when I was, when I was a, a young boy, I heard something <clears throat> and I said, that's my name. And so I chose a nickname. And so all my life, I went by this nickname. Now, you might say, what was it? Well, I'm telling you. <laughs> nobody knows. That, this, that, I, I bring it up once in a while that I have this nickname, but nobody knows. I, you know, ever since I've been in Australia, everybody wants to find out what this nickname is. They called my, my home church. They tried to hold my kids. <laughs> and they say, what is his nickname? Well, I'm not telling. Yeah. But I chose it as a kid, and it stuck. So I've got it to this day. My brothers and sisters still call me this name. You know, they don't call me by Larry. And so, uh, they, and so they asked me one time, they said, they said Larry said, you know, uh, you know, now that you're a preacher, said, you know, do we have to call you Larry? I said, nah. I said, uh, I said if you call me Larry, I probably wouldn't know who you're talking about. <laughs> so I have this nickname to them. But, you know, but names do mean something in the Bible. You know, and I think there's a message here for all of us as we look into this and we see what happened to Joseph. You know, you know, let's recount just a little bit. You know, Joseph was born to a family and he seemed to be a favorite to his father. You know, his father looks at him and says, you know, I love the boy. So he makes him a coat of many colors. Well, this is arranged as his brothers. They're all older, and, but you know, dad's not loving them the way he loves his new son. You know, and so he cares for him. And then uh, not only is his brothers enraged, but God gives uh, Joseph the ability to have dreams and to know dreams. And so as he gives him these dreams, he tells the dreams, and the dreams interpretation is that all my brothers are going to bow down to me, and I'm going to be the authority over them. That sure helped the whole situation. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a special coat no one else has. Dad loves me better than all of the rest of you. And I had, I, and now I, I, I've had a dream, and all you got about down to me. <laughs> you think after a while this, he'd wake up to himself, but no, he has another dream. And this dream, everyone's bowing down to him again, but not mom and dad does too. So this has really helped the situation. His brother gets to the place they just hate him. They don't have anything to do with it, you know. And here he is growing up in a family of wanderers. They're, they're going from place to place, you know, and, you know, and so they're setting up and, and putting down their home all the time, watching after uh, their, their sheep, their cattle, whatever they, they might have, and each, body, uh, each person has a job, and they're all doing this work together, and they're going about, you know, but for Joseph, he's probably one of the most isolated young men that's out there. There's no go off and you know dad dad says well you need to go find your brothers for me and so they go off and they go off he heads down to Dothan looking for his brothers finds out they're 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 in the middle of whoop whoop someplace and so they he goes off looking after looking for them and he finally finds them and they see him coming they said hey Joseph's coming and dad's not around we can take care of Joseph we don't like him anyway you know he and and so when they come, they want to kill him, but they won't kill him. You know the story. What did they do with him? They stuck him in a pit. Yeah. Have you ever been mistreated by an older brother or sister? Man, I was the youngest 
of five. There were six of us, but my, my oldest brother had died. You know, but there, I've had all these others, and none of them wanted the little kid to hang around them. My, my oldest brother used to torment me. Oh, you would not believe. I, I tell you some things that he used to do. Uh, I don't know whether it's the right type of atmosphere or not, but you know, we used to like to go camping. And you know, one of the things he used to do, he used to take me, uh, when I when I get in the sleeping bag, and I'd just be dozing off, and he'd take and pull the sleeping bag o- over my head uh, so I couldn't breathe, only the air that's down there in the bag. Well, he's sleeping in the same bag, so you can imagine what he does while my head's in the bag. <sighs> that's my oldest brother. Yeah, you know, my old sister, she used to uh, try and make me do what, what she wanted to do, and if I wouldn't do it, she'd tie me in chairs. You know, this is, this is my family. Yeah, you know, they loved me a lot, but Joseph wasn't even loved, and so he was put in a pit. And so uh, they, they decided not to kill him. They said, we'll sell him into slavery. And so he's sold into slavery. He goes off, and he's given to Potiphar. Yeah, you know, but what did, the, what did Pharaoh say? No one else is going to be able to rule over my house, over all I have other than you. You'll be second unto me. And everywhere he goes, God seems to put him in the same situation. He goes to Potiphar's house. And there, uh, you know, Potiphar sees that he is a a man worthy. And he says, I'll give you the job of running everything. Just a young boy, basically. But he's running the household. You know, and he's second only uh, to Potiphar, but Potiphar's wife you know, puts her eyes on this young man. You know, it's amazing how that a young life, you know, with all the talents and everything else uh, that you have, the devil will put someone in your path to destroy what you have. You know, every one of us are a gift of God. Every one of us is something, has been given something special. And the beauty and innocence of, our, of children and, and the things that God has for potential can be destroyed uh, by just a single person. You know, and this is what I believe the devil is ready to do with Potiphar's wife. But somewhere along the line, I don't know whether mom or dad or somebody had put enough inside Joseph. He said, no, no, no. And he ran, left his cloak. Well, accused of you know, this heinous act, he's sent off to prison. In prison, same thing. You know, they see he's he's man worthy. He said, "You'll you'll rule over all everything that goes on in the prison. And you'll be answered only to me." And that was the head of the prison. And so here, Joseph is taking care of everything. And you know, you have the butler and you have the baker and uh, and no uh, no is the butler and baker no. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is the butler baker. I, I, I got that little thing. Butler baker counselor maker. <laughs> But, you know, uh, and, you know, and so these men are there, and he gives one a good dream that you're going to live. The other one is going to die. But the other forgets him. Well, things aren't going well for uh, Joseph. But eventually, Pharaoh has a dream. What happens? He says, you know, give me a man. Well, God uh, puts the remembrance that yeah, there's a man in prison, brings him out. And, of course, as the story goes, Joseph is uh, able to interpret the dream, show Pharaoh all that's coming, and he says, okay, here is what you're going to do. You're going to be second to me in all of Egypt. And so this is the basic story. We all, we all know that. But what was it like going through every step of that? What was it like to become, you know, the child hated at home? What was it like to finally see that hatred come to a place where uh, they throw you in a pit because they really wanted to kill you. And you see, you see them actually take the money and sell you in slavery. What was it like to, uh, to make that trip, not knowing your future at all, and to finally get to uh, Egypt and there uh, yeah, be placed into, into this man Pharaoh's, uh, Potiphar's house? And what was it like before he, they, they saw the worth of him to be able to be doing the work of a slave. You know, all this was, uh, it was going on. And over and over and over, somehow, uh, he had to find help from God. He had to find the strength from God. He had to find the ability to overcome what was going on in his life. Because as we read the life of Joseph, 
We don't see it talk about the pain and anguish and everything else that he went through. We don't hear about him crying himself to sleep at night. We don't hear about all, all the things that went on and, and what he must have truly felt. The Bible never really tells us that. The only thing we know of those days, uh, you know, uh, Joseph sums up, says, God meant it for good. And so here he is, second ruler. He's been given a wife, you know, and she's the daughter of, of a priest. And so does this priest worship God? Well, then probably not. You know, and so here he, he's in a family of people who worship idols and such and everything else. And, and he's in a land that doesn't worship God. And he's all by himself. And he's got this wife now. And, you know, and so uh, he's married. A child comes along. Two children, in fact. Manasseh and Ephraim were born to Joseph. A man who's been in trials like nothing else. Have you been in a trial where you felt like you just couldn't find an answer Something that just seems to go on and on and on and on. You know, I, I, I've, I've known people who uh, have been in car accidents and their whole life, they used to be in great energy and, and, and strength and they used to do stuff all the time. Now their, their life was bedridden. You know, the things that they had to adjust and face, you know, it's nothing that I, I could uh, comprehend. You know, I sit down on those bedsides and try to talk to them and, and try to comfort them. But, you know, I don't understand that. I really don't. I've still got mobility. I still have my life, basically. And, and yet so much has been taken away from them. But this one uh, gentleman, every time I'd go there, he would say, God's got a purpose. God's got a, and one of the things that he did, uh, that everyone who came along, you know, had to set and he had to give them his testimony. And he had to share with them the blessings of God in his life. And this, he said, this is my ministry. My ministry is to encourage. You know, and you think, how could you be an encourager? Well, it's because what God had done in his life. I knew another woman uh, who, who had been sick a long time, and she couldn't do anything. And, uh, you know, and she was bedridden, couldn't get up out of the bed. But she had taken her wall, and she had put uh, you know, a map up there, and she took prayer cards Anyone who came to the church, she made sure that a prayer card was sent to her house. And she put up on the wall, and she prayed for everybody all over the world. So I'll never go. I'll never win a person to Christ unless they come to my house. But I can, I can uh, help all these missionaries. And that was her ministry. You know, it's, to overcome the adversities of life is, is a tough thing. It truly is. But we see here that, you know, when God gave Joseph two sons, he gave him one son first, and that man, or that child, was Manassas. The word Manassas means basically to forget it, to forget, to let it go, to not hold on. You know, and, uh, and here, uh, he, the Bible even tells us that when, we, when we're reading this, it says in 51, it says, and Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manassas, uh, for, God, uh, for God said he, had made me forget all my toils and all my father's house. He named this child because God showed him uh, that he could forget all that had taken place. It doesn't matter anymore. I'm letting you just let it go. Just forget it. And so he forgot those things. And he forgot, you know, the, the toils. He forgot the anguish. He forgot what had been taking place. And so, uh, you know, he said, I, I don't need this. I don't, this doesn't have to control me. And he let go of all that. And he got to the place uh, where he looked ahead and what God would have for his life rather than what's been in the past. You know, isn't it a shame that too many people live in the past? We had a lady in our church up in Rockhampton. And, you know, she was a lovely lady, really was. But her last children that she had, she had twins. And with these twins, uh, one died. She had two boys, and one died. And every year, we knew her when her when her uh, when her uh, the son that was alive. Uh, I guess he he was what uh, six? I think it was when we first met her. This boy was six. Yeah. And every year, when that child died, she would go and put an ad out in the paper in 
you know, more or less saying how much she missed her child, and this is the anniversary of his death. You know, and she and she would weep and she would cry, and no one could console her for about a week because she kept going back to rehearse that death, what she had lost in that child. Yet she had another child, and that child wasn't loved the way the, the dead one was loved. And she didn't care for that child the way she cared for the dead child. And she, and she, and she was in misery for at least a whole week uh, after she put out this ad. And she would think, oh, he was such a beautiful boy, and, and his hair was so black, and, and she, she would go over these things. And one day she called me and she said, says, Pastor, so would, would you come and, and would you talk with me? She says, says I, I just feel so miserable over the death of my son. And she, I, I, I said, well, I'll be glad to come. I said, but can I tell you the truth? She says, of course, that's why I want you to come. So I went to her and I said, you know, I said, can I put it something to you? I said, you have gone through something no one ever really wants to go through. They never want to lose a child. I said, but you have. I, I said, and please don't think I'm insensitive, but God doesn't want you to live in that area of death. God doesn't want you to take that child and dig it up out of the grave and carry it in your arms and, and, and see its eyes and everything else over and over. That child is in the hands of God, and you need to live for the, for the rest of your family. You need to live uh, in, in, I guess you'd say, uh, in the blessings of God that he has. You know, the, the dead are dead. And as much as we, we'll probably never get over that pain completely, but that's not where you stay. And it's wrong to go back every year and drum it up again and live in that pain. But you see, that's what we do. Sometimes we, 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 we enjoy that pain, I guess. It becomes a comfort to us because it says, I feel. I feel for what just took place. I feel for the, uh, that. And so I, I don't, never want to forget that child. I never want to forget that situation. And so we hold on to that like it's almost uh, you know, a savior for us. To feel again. And so, as I told her that, you could see her countenance change. She didn't like what I had said. But I said, you know, you can't live in the death. And I found so many people hold on. We had another lady that uh, came to church. And every Father's Day... She could not deal with anything yet in church. She wouldn't come to church on Father's Day because she was abused by her father. And she says, oh, I just can't do it. I said, but church is where you should be. Church is what God wants you to be a part of. You need the comfort and strength and fellowship of what church will give you. And I said, just because what your father did, you, you won't come on a Father's Day because you're in. I said, you know, she's doing the same thing. She's living in that pain all the time and chooses to live there. You see, God never wants us to do that. God never wants us to live in the pain and the places of, of anguish. And that's why uh, when Joseph had a child, he said, the first child, he says, I'm going to name you forget it because I don't need to live there anymore. I don't need that to control my life. I need a son that I'll love and care for. And when I see him, I'm reminded of the blessings of God. And so I don't need to go back in that miry clay. I don't need to go in that dirt and that filth and just stay in that area. I have victory over, over all these things because of the blessings of God. You know, but if something happens in a battle and things go wrong, you're going to stay there in the wrong? You can't do that. You just can't. You know, uh, it's like going back and reopening a wound all the time. Oh, that thing never heals, but you never leave it alone. You know, are you bitter about something? Are you hurt by something? Is there something that just plagues you all the time that will not let you carry on and serve God, takes away your joy? You need a Manassas in your life. You need to forget it. But not only was there a Manassas, but God gave him off on Ephraim. And Ephraim, well, you know, what was for Ephraim? It more or less means fruitfulness, to have fruit. You know, and here, uh, he, he, the first one, he says, I need to forget all the toils and all the wrong that's been done to me. But also... I need to remember that my life has been fruitful in God. And so my second son is going to show that. I have been fruitful with God in all, every place I've been. 
I've been in second command since I've been thrown in the pit. Everywhere I've gone, I've been second command. I was second command with Potiphar. I'm second command in the prison. I'm second command in, in Egypt. And I have all these blessings because God has prospered me. And here I am. And I have, I have fruit like nothing else. Everywhere I have gone, God, uh, everyone has seen God's hand on me. And they see the Spirit of God in me. And they see that God is using me everywhere I go. And there's a rejoicing in Him because uh, from all the wrong, yet God has produced the fruit in the midst of the wrong. You know, and sometimes I wonder why we can't see the fruit in our own life. Why can't we see that God can take us and bless us beyond the problems that come in our life? You know, but Joseph's story you know, would never have been possible, really. You know that without the trials? You think about reading the life of Joseph if, if he never uh, had an argument with his brothers. What would this story be like if he had never gone to you know, Potiphar's house or uh, prison? Or all? What, what would this story be about? You probably get, and Joseph had 12 sons. And after these 12 sons, you had Joseph. Well, that's it. You can close the rest of the book. Because the rest of the book has to deal with Joseph. And how Joseph led and took care of, of Jacob and brought them down to, uh, to uh, Egypt. And there's such great wealth of reading, all because there was a Joseph. But Joseph's life was full of these trials. Joseph's character was built because he faced all these adversities. He faced everything he had come, and so he, he flourished in the midst of all these problems. You know, and so you and I, when we go through things, I, I pray we can see you know, two things in our life. That we can forget the wrong and all the pain and find fruitfulness in God. You know, but what, what does this show us when you read the story and you see these two uh, sons? You see all that took place with, place with Joseph. You know, hope you can see a gracious God who looks after his own. A gracious God who knows the beginning and end of a life. A gracious God who says, I have a plan for a nation. I'm going to build something, but to build something and to make something become uh, all I want it to be, someone's got to suffer. And someone's got to come out of the suffering trusting God. And Joseph's last words basically were, you know, when you leave, take me with you. Because that's where the promise is. The promise is in the promised land. I want to be there as well. This is not the promise for me. The, the, this land where I have prospered, this land where I was second command, this is not the will of God for my life. It's the will of God right now, but the will of God is that all of us will be in the promised land where God wants us to be. And that's what he's looking forward to. And so, uh, you know, he's going through his life. And I wonder, as Joseph was going through his life and he's becoming an old man, you know, his brothers come back and, and he renews acquaintance with them and dad's coming back uh, and coming down. And they're all going to move into Goshen. And, you know, and he sees the different things that take place. He sees the guilt in his brother's faces, and he sees everything that, that's going about as he's bringing his family back. You know, I wonder if uh, there are times he's just thinking, boy, I could really get even with these guys. I could, I, you know, and so for Simeon and for Levi and for all the rest of them, all they did to me, I could get them back. And I wonder if Manasseh doesn't walk and say, Dad, just forget it. Just forget it. You know, and when he sees all it taking place, he says, you know, all my life, all I got to show for it is being the son-in-law to an idolater, being second command to uh, people who care not about really God. And so what kind of a Jewish young man have I, uh, can I be? But he had an Ephraim come by and said, Dad, look at the fruit in your life. Look how our people prosper. Look at what all God's done for us. Look at what God's placed in front of us. And so he stands uh, you know, with these children, reminded every day that you know, God ha can take of every situation. Just forget it. Let the wrong be, uh, be put in the past, and let everything that's been done to you be put in the past, because God meant it for good. 
Look at the fruit in your life and look where you have prospered. You had nothing. You were a slave. But now your second command in all of Egypt. You have saved so many lives and you have prospered Egypt to a place that they have the wealth of the world. All because God put you in this place. Dad, you're fruitful. You're fruitful. And this is what we need to show to our children. Our children, as they watch us and they see us, uh, see us try to lead them, they need to see us being willing to forget the wrong done in our lives and just trust God. They need to also see us that we have become fruitful even when others don't believe and trust what we have to say. And so here he is, second in Egypt, you know, but all the wrong has been done to him. But he said as, at, the, at the last, God meant it for good. You know, I guess my question for us this evening is, what is God doing in our life? Can we trust him? You know, are you going to let bitterness and pain and everything else control us in such a place that we'll never forget? You know, Joseph said, I, I'm, I'm going to have a reminder every day. I'm going to have a Manassas. And I need to understand that I, I'm fruitful in God. He has prospered me. So I have a son called Ephraim. And so with these two children growing up before him, just a reminder every day, I'm fruitful and blessed of God. So with all this, I'll just forget it. You know, it doesn't matter that I was a slave. It doesn't matter I, I've been done wrong in Potiphar's house. It doesn't matter that I was forgotten in the prison. I'm second, I'm second in Egypt. My family is, uh, is here in this land uh, of Goshen, and they're being cared for, and they're prospering, they're growing, all because God allowed me to go through these things. You know, I think you and I should be able to trust God the same way. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we ask that, Lord, you be with us. Thank you for this time. And, Lord, this isn't one of those bang-on messages, I guess. But, Lord... It's still a truth here that, Lord, I think every child of God needs to grip, uh, come to grips with. And that is, Lord, it doesn't matter what wrong has been done in our lives. We can forget it and just trust God and live for God. Let the past be in the past and live, for, uh, live our future under the hand of God. Lord, I ask that you direct us. Help us to see that our lives can be fruitful if we allow God to use us. If we will not live in that past, we will not live in that wrong, if we will not pick at the scabs, we can have a fruit that's so blessed of God, it changes the lives of others. Lord, I ask that you'd help us and be with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. like two gloves and um, read first Peter chapter one in light of that message and um, yeah it's it's a message repeated throughout the scriptures forgetting those things which are behind I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God he's coming he's coming and he has everything in his hand and your path that you take is for your blessing and it's God's hand working in your life to mold you and make you what he, he wants you to be, to be conformed into his image. Thank you, preacher. Now, you don't know how, uh, I'm sure you had that, especially for me and for others, to see God's hand, that our path sometimes seems rough and steep, but God is guiding it. And don't despair. Don't despair. Look ahead. Look ahead. It will come a day. Mm -hmm. And your trials being much more precious than gold that perisheth. Mm -hmm. So let's let the Lord have his way. Now we want you to just come and play a song. And we'll just bow our heads. And let's think tonight about what God has done. And God is doing in our life right now. Let's thank him for it. And seek what he's trying to do. We may not be able to see today the future of what he's planning. But what you're going through now 
is forming you to be able to do a work. Just bow your head and say, Lord, show me as much as you want to show me. But Lord, help me look to you and look ahead. Forgetting those things which are behind, I press towards that mark, that prize of the high calling of God. Are you pressing forward tonight? Just like this church has a path that God is taking it. It's not to live in the past, for those things don't change. But it is to live in the future, to see what God has until he comes. Let the Lord have it. Take your burden to the Lord. I'm reading through Job right now. We don't always understand in the midst of those testings what God is doing. But God will always prove to be faithful. Trust him. Look to him. Let him have his way in your life. Father, Lord, we thank you that you are just a loving God who guides our steps. Each step of the way, our Savior leads. And Lord, while we don't know the future, we do know the promises that you give us. And Lord, that we're in your hands and you'll safely guide us. Take us this week. And as we take each step we take, our Savior goes before. And Lord, we know that we can follow you every day. Lord, help each one of us to claim the victories in Jesus Christ and look forward to the reward that is in the future. Thank you, Lord, for loving us tonight. Thank you for the fellowship we have in Jesus' name. Amen. We do have some cake in the refrigerator, so if you'd like to stick around, have some very nice passion fruit cake. There's some out there and a little bit of coffee and whatever you need. So, all right, you're dismissed. Mm -hmm.